Great. Hi, this is Rakan Mosley from Oxford Economics. Can I start by welcoming everyone onto the webinar and thank you for joining um, today's end of the debt induced growth model. For those of you who are new to Oxford Economics, as a brief introduction, we were founded in 1981 as a joint venture with Oxford University and we are now the world's leading independent global forecasting and advisory firm providing analytical tools, forecasts and reports on 200 countries, 100 industries, and 3,000 cities. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping points. Gabriel Stein, Director of Asset Management Services, will be providing us with a, a 20 to 25 minute presentation, and will then be taking some questions. So if you would like to ask a question, there should be a, a drop down box at the top of your screen. So please use the chat icon, um, send it to the host, Adrienne, and this can be done at any point throughout the presentation. That's all for me. I'm going to pass it over to Gabriel. Thank you very much, Rakan. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world. I assume there's no one who's listening in from East Asia, in which case it would be good evening. Um, I am going to talk about a long-term secular change in the world economy. Perhaps that's fitting because it is the end of the year. Um, and um, it is a good time to look perhaps not only to next year but beyond. Uh, and the theme I want to address is what if, the, uh, if we've come to an end of the debt-induced growth model. And uh, let me summarize what I'm going to say and then go back and talk about it in detail. Um, essentially, for much of the first uh, four post-war decades, the growth of debt in the non-bank private sector and the growth of GDP kept pace. Um, but from the mid to late 1980s, increased leveraging in a number of countries meant that the amount of debt necessary to create one unit of GDP rose. Uh, now, in many countries, this came to an end with a Great Recession. And I'm positing that we may be witnessing the beginning of a secular change towards output growth that's not necessarily debt induced. Now, what does this all mean? Uh, and this is, I suppose, the bottom line. Uh, it almost certainly means higher household savings and probably corporate savings, which means lower long-term interest rates than we have been used to over the past couple of decades, though higher than they are right now. It means a change in the role of banks towards more investment style banking and private equity activity. Um, it probably means a change in corporate borrowing towards more equity based financing and market based finance. And there may also be a change um, in particularly the Anglo Saxon economies towards a greater role for rental uh, accommodation as opposed to home ownership. Now, what do I mean by all this and uh, how do I get to these conclusions? I'm going to show um, a number of charts for a number of different countries, but I'm then uh, going to go back to the first chart which shows the United States and stick to using the US as an example. But let me, uh, so let me start with that. This chart shows two lines, but I would draw your attention to the red line. The red line shows, in essence, the five-year moving average of how many extra dollars of debt in the non-bank private sector it took to create one dollar of extra GDP. Um, now, this is the pattern for the United States. Um, looking at a few other countries, this is Japan from 1972 until uh, Japan went into deflation. I had to stop there because once GDP growth becomes negative, uh, the numbers become meaningless. But as you can see, very much a similar pattern. Um, the UK, Australia, and then countries with slightly different pattern, Canada, Sweden, France, and the Netherlands. Now, it, we will send these slides out to anyone who requests them, and I may refer to them from time to time, but the key one I'd like to speak about is the American one. Now, essentially what this shows is that uh, and bear in mind this is a five-year moving average, that from the late 1950s, as it happened 
actually from the mid-1950s until the mid-1980s, um, each extra dollar of GDP was based on one dollar of extra debt in the non-bank private sector. In other words, GDP growth and debt growth, or if you want, debt growth and income growth, kept pace. Now, in the mid, in the early to mid 1980s, uh, the uh, this changed. This was the era of junk bonds when Michael Milken and his lot were running wild on Wall Street. And the incremental debt to GDP ratio rose from around one to around one and a half. Uh, but this uh, then reverted back to the long term average in the 1990s when we had the era of return to shareholder values. Um, however, from the mid 90s onwards, um, the incremental debt to GDP ratio uh, in the US began to rise almost inexorably. It passed $2, it passed $2.50, and in the five years to the first quarter of 2009, it was slightly in excess of $3, and then the debt burden became too much, and uh, the whole thing collapsed. Uh, now, looking very quickly at other countries, as I said, do we have a similar pattern? Yes, we had in Japan, around 1.5 yen per yen of extra debt until the bubble years in Japan when it shot up to about three and a half and collapsed. In the UK, uh, very similar pattern to the United States. In fact, the slightly higher debt, per debt to GDP, uh, incremental debt to GDP ratio at the peak. Uh, Australia, again, very similar pattern. The interesting thing with Canada and with Sweden is that deleveraging seems to have gotten started, but then became interrupted. Whereas in France and in the Netherlands, at least until 2012, deleveraging doesn't seem to have happened. Let me move back to the United States again. Um, so far, this has looked at the past, what happened, and so on. However, my contention here is that uh, what we are going to see as a result of this is a major change in the behavior of households and companies, and therefore also uh, affecting um, banks and asset prices. Um, and the main point is that we that the incremental debt to GDP ratio is likely to move back towards its long term stable average, which in the case of the United States is around uh, one dollar of debt in the non bank private sector for one dollar of extra GDP. Uh, or perhaps to give it some margin, we should say between half and one and a half dollars of debt for each dollar of extra GDP. Um, why would we move back to this? Um, well, one reason is because actually, trite as it may sound, um, most uh, long-term trends tend to move back uh, towards some kind of, or, or revert to some kind of average. Um, more importantly, uh, a one-for-one one ratio would also indicate that the growth of debt is keeping pace with the growth of income. Uh, that is intuitively logical. You can, for a brief period of time, of course, have debt growing much faster than income, uh, not least if that debt is used to invest in something that will generate higher income in the future, but it is not a long-term sustainable development, certainly not for households and companies, both of which have to uh, repay GDP uh, as opposed to, uh, sorry, repay debt as opposed to governments, which don't really have to do it, or at least be able to service debt, and in the case of households, out of current income. So that's one reason. Another reason is perhaps more behavioral. Um, memories of debt deflation are extremely powerful. Uh, the generations that grew up in the 1920s and 1930s experienced varying from country to country between one and three debt deflation episodes. They did not want to borrow money. Uh, in fact, uh, if you were to discuss uh, finance with um, anyone who lived through the 1920s and 30s, they will almost certainly have said, you do not borrow money. Uh, and uh, in fact, it took US households uh, more than 30 years 
to the 1960s before they started to borrow uh, to the same extent that they had done in the 1920s. So the first, uh, uh, the first impact is likely to be less, uh, less borrowing. And less borrowing uh, almost certainly will also mean higher savings, certainly initially so as deleveraging continues. Higher savings in turn uh, is likely uh, to mean downward pressure on long-term interest rates. Um, that's one reason, but there is also, if, if that is the reason why the borrowers are likely to borrow less, there is also a reason why the lenders are likely to lend less. And that is because in the wake of the Great Recession, uh, monetary authorities, central banks, fi uh, finance inspections and so on all over the world are becoming more and more focused on macroprudential stability. Now, Macroprudential stability can be uh, defined in a number of different ways and expressed in a number of different ways, but it boils down to one thing, constraints on the growth of credit. Um, whether it be through, uh, if we look, say, at household loans, if whether it be through lower loan to uh, value ratios for housing loans, um, whether it be for high deposits, whether it be uh, higher capital asset ratios for banks, macroprudential stability means uh, less credit growth. So from the household perspective, as said, uh, and from the borrower perspective, one impact is likely to mean uh, higher savings and therefore lower interest rates. What about from the other side? Well, um, from the banking side, um, lower credit growth is likely to mean that the role of banks will change more uh, in the direction of investment banking, which is rather ironic seeing that uh, there is a uh, widespread belief, erroneous but nevertheless there, that investment banks bore a great responsibility for the outbreak of the Great Recession. Also, banks are likely to move more towards uh, private equity type activity. Um, it also means that banks' balance sheets are likely to change um, almost certainly towards, uh, as we all do know, a higher capital asset ratio. It also means that the asset side of banks' balance sheets is likely to uh, take on a greater share of short-term government paper. That, of course, uh, should be good news for the health of the banking system. It also means a likely change for uh, corporate finance um, in countries where companies are borrowing more uh, from banks or by raising debt. Um, it is likely to mean a shift towards more equity-based finance, but also towards more uh, disintermediated uh, corporate borrowing, that is to say companies borrowing directly from markets that may be a minor point, but of course one consequence of that is uh, slower broad money growth. If uh, companies borrow, or, or households for that matter, borrow from banks, money is created. Um, if they borrow directly from markets, there is no increase in money, and the money they borrow uh, cannot be spent by someone else. Um, so there are substantial changes um, which, however, will take a very long time to uh, work their way through. So the question is, why am I bringing this up now? Secular changes in general, as I said, do take a long time to work through, but they are also, it doesn't mean that they all happen at one go at the end. On the contrary, we are already seeing some of the trends of this uh, happening already. Notably, of course, weaker credit growth uh, and greater emphasis on macroprudential stability. Um, and for that reason, uh, this is a trend which uh, asset managers in particular, but really anyone in the economic field in, and who operates in any kind of market should be aware of. Um, I'd like to end this brief presentation with one point. Um, we have had 
very successful debt-induced growth for many years, for about 30 years. Why can't we continue with that? And can we actually have output growth that is not debt-induced? Uh, the answer to the first question is, well, we can continue with debt-induced growth, but as we have seen already in the United States, in China, and in countries in between the two in terms of development, if growth is constantly based on debt, um, then at some stage a bubble develops in one market and as it bursts, uh, growth comes to a halt and the only way to resuscitate it is by having the monetary authorities becoming serial bubble blowers. The housing market crashes, inflate an equity bubble. If the equity market crashes, shift to bonds and so on. Um, that is not particularly good for economic stability um, and it's probably in the long run not good for growth. The secondary uh, question, can we have uh, output growth, healthy output growth that is not debt induced? Um, and the answer is perfectly clear. Yes, of course we can. Uh, if you want to go to an extreme, you can look at, for instance, the situation during World War II, when credit to the non-bank private sector practically didn't grow at all, but the economies grew substantially. That is perhaps, as I said, an extreme example. But if you look at the 1950s and 1960s, um, when the incremental debt to GDP relationship in the United States, as I said, was about one for one and similar in a number of countries, those were actually quite strong uh, output growth years. There were some special factors, and notably pent-up demand uh, from the war years that erupted in the 1950s, uh, rising populations and so on, but those do not explain the entire growth story, and so it's pretty clear we can have growth that is not based on uh, ever uh, more inflated bubbles, um, and the issue is perhaps only what is the uh, transition from here to there. But that, as I said, is a long-term story, and this is therefore something we will return to uh, in the future. I am now very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Great. So the first question we have come in. So you have so far spoken only of the non-bank private sector and its debt, but other sectors borrow as well. How does this fit in with your story? Um, I've spoken about – actually, that's a really good question, one I need to address. I'm writing a research briefing about this for publication today or tomorrow, and I, I, I need to, to add that point. Um, the reason – I've looked at only two of the four sectors' uh, debts because we have households, non-financial companies, financial companies, and the public sector. It's something that I partly alluded to uh, earlier when I said that households and non-financial companies usually have to repay debt. Uh, governments don't really have to repay debt. Governments only have to be perceived to be able to repay debt but they can, all, they can almost always, uh, certainly so in advanced economies, uh, they can roll over debt, not so for households. Uh, as for the financial sector, its debt uh, has generally tended, not in the run-up to the Great Recession, but prior to that, has generally tended to be less than the non-financial sector and the uh, household sector debt, certainly taken together, but more importantly, its ability to repay debt is in a way a function of the ability of the non-financial sectors to repay debt. So to me, it's the non-financial private sectors that are, uh, that are crucial here. Uh, if they no longer can cope with their debt burden, that will hit the financial sector, and, and, and that in turn will hit the public sector. And in fact, that is what we saw during the Great, uh, during the great Recession, notably in a number of European countries. Um, if households and companies have a debt problem, it becomes a bank problem. If banks have a debt problem, it becomes a taxpayer problem. Um, any further questions? Yes. So uh, another question is, how certain are you that the developments you outline will come to pass? Oh, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. The, the answer is um, I can't be certain at all. Uh, this is an attempt to 
analyze a long-term secular trend, uh, something which probably will take between five and ten years to develop. Um, it certainly isn't going to develop exactly the way I've outlined, but it seems to me on the basis of history and on the basis of what triggered the Great Recession that this is a likely way forward um, uh, in advanced economies. Uh, there are other factors that could play a role here. I, I mentioned that one reason I thought households in particular would borrow less is because of memories of, of uh, debt deflation being extremely powerful. Um, it's also the case that in times of greater inequality, households tend to borrow less. And it does seem that we are in currently in an era of greater inequality. Um, but can I be 100% sure that this will all turn out this way? No, no, I just think it's, it's important enough. The likelihood is high enough so that we need to be aware of it. I don't think anybody can be 100% sure on that one. But, um, but we're forecasters. We're supposed to be. <laughs> of course. Yeah. What does it What does it all mean for for asset prices, though, Gabriel? Uh, this is a tricky one as well because, of course, any real impact on asset prices um, is so far ahead in the future that nothing I say here and now is going to mean. Um, is, is going to make anyone say, oh gosh, this is, this is amazing, I'd better go and change my uh, asset allocation on this basis. But I would have thought um, that a, a greater emphasis on equity finance uh, and less on credit um, is likely to mean uh, bigger equity markets and more attractive equity markets um, Obviously, uh, lower interest rates um, should necessarily mean, sh should also by definition mean more attractive bond markets. But what I'm talking about here is that um, nominal and, and real bond yields both uh, are likely over, say, the next 10, 15 years to be lower than they've been over, say, the 20 years leading up to the Great Recession. And uh, but that doesn't mean that they will be lower than they are now. Uh, and moreover, uh, these secular trends interact with the structural trends, which are, I suppose, up to five years duration, and then cyclical trends that interact with those and that are shorter. And there are day-to-day -day trends. So, so, so all I can say is I think it will be very interesting to, to uh, be an equity manager uh, or, 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 or to invest in equities 10 years from now, but, but whether it will, uh, in fact, I can probably guarantee that uh, there will be ups and downs on the way from here to there. Okay, um, we did get another question is, uh, a question in rather, it looks like quite a passionate one. You are only talking about the incremental debt GDP ratio. Why not talk about the debt GDP ratio? Ah, yeah, um, this is the point that has been made by some of my colleagues here uh, as well. Um, and the slide that's now up on the screen actually shows the two ratios for the United States. The red line, as said, is the incremental debt to GDP ratio. How many dollars of debt in the non-bank private sector did it take to create one dollar of GDP? The blue line shows the non-bank private sector debt to GDP ratio. Um, and as we can see, the two lines uh, move, roughly speaking, in parallel, though, of course, uh, the red line is somewhat more volatile. Um, I simply found that the uh, using the concept of, uh, as I said, how many dollars of extra debt does it take to create one dollar of extra GDP was a better illustration of uh, um, a, a better illustration of the likely behavior that I'm forecasting. However, th there is one point which perhaps should be made, and I haven't added the debt-to-GDP ratio for the non-bank private sector to the other countries, but one of the things that um, springs to mind when you look at this is why is it that in France and in the Netherlands, households can blissfully uh, borrow um, 
up to seven or eight uh, euros in, in the Netherlands and um, uh, five or six euros in France uh, per extra uh, euro of GDP, whereas in Australia and Canada and the United States and the UK, um, this didn't work up once it came to three, three and a half units of currency per unit of extra GDP, um, the process came to a shuddering halt. I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, one reason could be, of course, if we look again at the, uh, the French, the explosion in French debt growth and Dutch debt growth, and um, perhaps to a lesser extent in Swedish debt growth as well, um, is that this came after uh, the Great Recession when interest rates had already fallen to rock bottom. So that made it cheaper to borrow, of course. Um, another po possible answer might be, and, and that relates to this question, uh, maybe the level of, G of debt to GDP was lower uh, and therefore, um, you know, if you start with a lower debt to GDP ratio, you can obviously borrow much more before you get to a debt level that's unsustainable. But um, I have looked at the numbers, and that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, as we can see, the U.S. debt to GDP ratio uh, came to an end in, in the non-bank private sector. It came to an end at about 170 percent. Um, in countries like France and Sweden, uh, France is a bit lower, Sweden is a bit higher, Netherlands uh, a bit lower, and so on. Um, there doesn't seem to be a pattern which explains this. So, um, I, I, it, it is a relevant point, but like I said, from, from a behavioral perspective, I found the uh, incremental debt to GDP ratio perhaps more, uh, uh, a better illustration of, of the points I was trying to make. Great. Well, I think that's about all for questions for now. I think that wraps it up. So thank you all very much for attending. Thank you, Gabriel, for today's webinar. And if, um, any of, if anybody has any further information or, or requires any more information on our, our services or a copy of the presentation, please do contact us directly. My email is rmosley at oxfordeconomics.com, um, but all of our details are on the website. Many thanks and have a good day.